what was then called the Regent Street Polytechnic School of Architecture at a particular period when the, the poly ran the AA a very hard run. And I can remember coming up as a spotty student from the provinces and being amazed by a project done by some bloke called Webb for the Furniture Manufacturers Association of High Wycombe. It was an extraordinary object full of bulbous shapes and a very organized structure. And then, a year later, he made a project which was euphemistically called the Sin Center. I think it has some rather more official title. And he became immediately an infamous and famous person on the London architectural scene. I will, I will take it always as a challenge to the objectivity of those of us who indulge in teaching that this project for the Sin Center was simultaneously failed five times by the Polytechnic and on show at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. That tells you something about teachers' objectivity. And he continued then to make more and more extraordinary and audacious projects which are certainly written into the history of architecture for many of us. The Sin Center was followed I'll just name two, by the Cushical and a project called Dreams Come True. Michael Webb taught at the Architectural Association between the years 1965 and 67, and then he went to America, and he has been what the Americans call an educator ever since. I like using this word educator because it's a kind of panacea which totally conceals as do the few facts that I've just mentioned, the real importance of the man. We've just seen an extraordinary display of bravado on the part of the, the lady from Tokyo, Itsuko Hasegawa, for the benefit of those of you who came in late. And we will see possibly a more extraordinary series of demonstrations not exactly of bravado so much of intensive thinking. I think it's too easy for people to just pigeonhole Mike Webb as a transplanted English eccentric who draws. And I think that the Guardian piece this morning by Rupert Spade conceals the fact, I think he just didn't understand the project, neither do I for that matter, and I hope to be enlightened this evening, but having watched blow by blow the, the work of Mike Webb, he goes so much further out in front of all of us that it makes us, A, dis very dissatisfied with what we do, and B, very excited with what he does. I was just trying to remember the place where I had met Ms. Hasegawa and first exchanged architectural ideas and eventually remembered a certain sitting room in Tokyo. I have just remembered the greasy spoon in Swiss Cottage, which alas is no longer there, thank God is no longer there, where architectural ideas, or perhaps it was the more loose sort of nod and wink and hunch and sniff that is really what this particular evening, both of them, both of the speakers, is about. I think I only saw the exhibition this morning and I'm far too biased and far too much of an of a MWeb supporter to, to be objective about it, but it's, I think, I mean, it is a knockout. There's no doubt about that. There are these weird, sometimes finished, it doesn't matter whether they're finished or unfinished or things or concept or pieces of mathematics, or pieces of inversions of all the very comfortable... Aren't we sitting here comfortably because we have these comfortable ideas of what architecture and the procedure of architecture and doing a good scheme and inventing something is about. However, however comfortable or uncomfortable we are, Mike Webb has been there before and is out there in front. I think there are two people who when the history of the mid to late 20th century is written in architectural terms, in creative terms, 
The two people I would single out are Walter Pichler and Mike Webb. And Mike Webb is here this evening. Is there any chalk anywhere so I can draw on the board? In front? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Lovely. I'll turn it this way so the people in the transept can hear my and see my thoughts. Let me turn it. Okay. Now everyone can see it. Hmm? I'm not quite sure of the order that this lecture is going to be in. It may be totally chaotic. I had trouble putting the slides in. And um, anyway, let's see how it goes. I'm going to use as my text Martin Pauli's article about the extras this morning in the uh, Guardian. And so I'm going to read some of it to you. I'm going to have to put on my glasses for that. Where, are they on? Um, where are my glasses? <laughs> ah, so I've only just recently had to wear these. I never know quite where they are. Where are you sitting along? <laughs> oh, no, no, here they are. It's all right, yes. Um, okay, yes. Well, the first thing I liked in his article this morning was that uh, I seem to be a country hick up in London for the day. What does it say here? Um, let's see. He still looks and sounds as though he's up in town for the day and shortly to return to the country. So I thought, you know, um, we deliver a lecture in an accent like that. <laughs> and then uh, go back down home to Oxfordshire. <laughs> anyway, no, I'm not going to do that. All right, um, what I want to do this evening is to explain the project to you, explain what the hell it's about, and do so through the enthusiasms I have that brought it into being in the first place. And to do that, I want to do some drawings on the board. I always love the idea of doing a real old-fashioned lecture, you know, the professor drawing on the board. Um, and so that's what I'm going to do. And the lecture is going to be not very long, and it's going... Oh, thanks very much. Yes, lovely. I'm actually going to show some drawings, do some drawings on the board, and show a few slides as well. Um, and the first thing I'm going to talk about, the first part of the lecture is going to be entitled Infinity. And it's a subject that fascinates me very much. And the first drawing I did of the project uh, is a one-point perspective, and it involves infinity, because if you're looking down rivers, railroad tracks, corridors, or what have you, you have something like this happening. You have converging lines, and then you have a horizon. I'm absolutely fascinated by what's starting to happen around this area on the horizon. And I realized early on that if one was to represent this image as a series of dots, the dot matrix representing this perspective view, one would then draw dots all the way up like this at regular intervals, you see, going on right up to there until perhaps straddling the horizon and also this vertical line here would be one single dot, the same diameter and spacing as all the others. And that a dot down here might represent a diameter perhaps of half an inch. It's very near to your eye. And a dot here, the one next to it, might be, say, an inch diameter. But one here is about eight feet diameter, right? If you take this plane of the perspective and hold it up vertically and measure all these in the plane of the drawing, the size of each dot starts to increase. One here might be about 500 feet diameter. One here might be half a mile diameter. And this one right here is infinite. I can't say infinitely large because infinity 
is neither big nor small. And I want to quote Pascal, which I got from reading a book by Borges. Pascal defined God as a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And that is also a definition of infinity, therefore God is infinity. And for an atheist, that's... Uh, but I suppose you have to be brought up in the faith, the Church of England, to believe that. Anyway. Um, now, I want to talk for a few moments about a formula connected with this, the Lorentz transformation. And it goes like this. Because his formula relates to objects that as they speed up towards the speed of light the mass increases to infinity and if you take that mass see this is a real old-fashioned lecture you know the sort that people sleep through right um, I want to talk about this because I think it's so incredible this formula the mass all right, which is called the measured mass. So let's put a little M there. That means a mass which could be an atom. And the measured mass is the mass of an object as it's speeding up, as it's going faster and faster. Because even if it's going three miles an hour, it's an ever so tiny bit has a greater mass than if it's stationary. So that is the mass when you measure it at a certain speed equals the rest mass, i.e. the mass when it's stationary, okay, divided by the square root of 1 minus the square of the velocity of the object, v squared, over the square of the speed of light. Right? What we're going to do is supplement transplant figures for these numbers. If, say, we make that 10, right, and we get the square root of 1 minus the speed of the object, say it's going 10 miles an hour, that's 100. And then, obviously, the square of the speed of light is a figure with far too many noughts to write about, so we'll have you know, something like that over there, right? going right off the board, what we find is, when we work this out, that this comes to a very little bit over 10. In other words, the mass, when it's moving quite slowly, is just a wee bit over 10. But, as you speed up more and more, this figure gets bigger and bigger, the top figure here. Instead of being 100, it might be 1,000 or a million or 50 million but it can never quite get to this figure here. Even, so if that ratio is 99.999 over 100, if you subtract it from 1, you're starting to get an immense figure. So this here gets huge. Measured mass near the speed of light is vast. Okay? Now, if you plot the distance of the center of each dot here from the observer, which is here, you're getting, remember, vast distances when you approach the horizon. And you plot these on a graph. Let's just uh, plot them on a graph over here. Okay? If you plot them down there, and say the distance there is very small. The distance here is a wee bit bigger. There it's a good bit bigger. Here it's getting really big. There it's getting immense. Here it's getting, you know, like that. Continue on the wall. And then you connect up a line for each of these readings. What you get is a curve that's doing that. When you plot the readings for measured mass, you get the same sort of curve. I think that's fascinating. I'm very excited by that. Now, I want to show a few slides for a moment that um, relate to this subject. So, what do I do here? Just press the uh, forward power in that. 
The which? The forward button. Which, where's that? Which is the forward button? This? Ah, oh, thanks. Oh, the blue one. This one. Okay. Oh, lovely, thanks. Yes. Okay. Oh, that's lovely. Yes. There you get the graph on the right-hand side of the picture. And here are some of the dots. And, of course, the building located at the intersection of the horizon with this vertical axis is in fact one dot in this particular drawing. And it is meant to be a view looking down the regatta course from the finishing point, which is a distance of about a mile and a half. <coughs> right? And the image of the temple, the little temple that's on the site that you've all seen in the drawings in the other room, is conveyed by one dot. In fact, were this drawing to be a photograph containing dots, everything would be a dot, but the temple itself would be conveyed, conveyed by one dot, actually two dots, because you're including the temple and its reflection. OK. Oh, yeah. This is actually a photograph taken by someone at the Guardian who stood on the hill behind the island and look down the length of the regatta course to the town. And it's an amazing <coughs> compression taken with a telephoto lens. Um, the start of the regatta course is about here. The finish is up there. And it looks rather like if you're rowing a single scarf up the regatta course, you're going to have to slam on the brakes when you get to the end, or you'll hit what happens to be the White Hart Hotel. Um, in fact, the distance from the church to the right-hand side of the picture is about 600 yards, and the distance from here to the church is about two miles. Funnily enough, this drawing done before I saw that particular photograph is likewise a compressed uh, view of the regatta course. This is the distance from the start to the finish, the one and a half miles. And it is the image of the temple conveyed through a dot matrix. And this drawing is intended to confuse the viewer because one sees the actual image of the temple there, but its reflection may be, in fact, a horizontal slab of material floating flush with the water that exactly occults, what a lovely word that is to use, meaning to cover completely. It actually occults the reflection in the water. So one never knows really whether one is looking at the reflection or the disk floating there. Now, also notice in this one, which is repeated in the drawing on show in a minute, um, that I've done it so that it's almost like there's an observer up in the sky, the absent god maybe, who is looking down at what someone standing here is seeing, but only seeing what the person here sees. And for instance, if I do this, I can hardly see any of you you're all blocked out. And so, likewise, in this drawing, a tree located here, the man here or the woman here can't see behind it. So the observer, who is in this position, um, can't see anything either. So there's a white shadow behind. And as God is supposed to be omniscient, and isometric and axonometric projection gives one an omniscient view of the world because you can't locate your own position, the sphere again, um, then I think this is an appropriate projection for God's view of the world. You 
see. This is actually the regatta course there, compressed down to a stubby, fat rectangle. Now, this drawing here... Is it possible to have a spotlight on this? Or something? Ah, no? Yes. So, there wasn't time to make slides of this, so... <laughs> I feel it's like an auction, you know. Isn't it? Can we start at um, 200 quid? Uh, so here, is, whoops, here are some more white shadows. In fact, you get everything casting double shadows. If you look at the big wheel or Ferris wheel, whatever you understand it as, which is um, situated there, one sees, if one happens to be within six feet from this drawing, the shadow coming from it cast by the sun. But also one on the hill, which is there, yeah, which is there, <laughs> because the hill rises up behind the ferris wheel, and so you see the white shadow, which may remind one of Hiroshima, perhaps, those awful grim shadows one sees in photographs shortly after the disaster. So there are strange connections one can make in this. Um, Ah. Um, can we have the lights out now? Thank you. Yes. So what one is doing really in this project, you see, there is an end product which is a building, believe it or not, or at least the image of the building. See, when you first embark down the river and Wishing that the views uh, allow the traveller the journey down the river, making the journey down the river be confined to a series of views with very close mathematical relationships to each other. Um, I thought it desirable to uh, enclose the traveller in a submarine because then these views could be limited these views could appear on the periscope and then further be presented as dot matrices. And so that in the first view, uh, two or four dots would represent the image of the temple. But then something goes wrong. In the next view, the traveler is allowed. Instead of more dots, you see, the image will be larger, so you would have more dots. Instead of more dots being assigned to the image, Sorry, instead of um, the image presenting in greater detail the shape of the temple, the computer breaks down and presents in more detail the shape of the initial dots. <coughs> and that keeps going on. And at a later stage, a uh, further disaster happens when the dot image starts to develop veil-like structures within it because the individual dot diameters go out of control. Now, when the traveler reaches the island, a further confusion is provided by the fact that uh, an image of the temple is provided actually behind where it is. One dot fills most of the screen. And this drawing here is really an effort to conjecture what the hell is going on. Now, this triangular shape is actually the landscape behind the temple. These are all hills in an attempt at creating shadows on them. And it's a conjectural explanation of this strange image on the screen. And this is a ellipse which seems to dip into the water at this end. And it's in fact about three miles long, and at the back it's about two miles in the air. This is actually one and a half, eight, one and a half miles off the ground. And what it is, is that this ellipse here, looks like an airship, 
is exactly occulting this shape here, this disc, so that when seen from there, this shape reads as a circle, just like all the other dots. Now, that's because the axis of this ellipse is set at an angle to horizontal. And it is not parallel to a line drawn from the observer there to the top of the outer disk. In the next one, in this one, this axis, the axis of the plane of the ellipse is parallel. And the result is that this shape here becomes infinitely large. In fact, it would stretch out beyond our galaxy to the edge of the universe. <coughs> These are, again, the hills behind the island. So, obviously, that's a conjecture that won't go very far. And that is my brush with infinity, it's a very fearful subject, a thing dropping to infinity. It's similar, I feel, to the fear that sailors had of dropping off the edge of the world before it was discovered to be round. All right. Um, now, that's the end of infinity. I want to go on to the next thing and refer again to Martin Paul's example. This is where also I want to pay tribute to David Green and his work, and in particular an article that appeared in 1971. <clears throat> Martin writes in this article, the Michael Webb of 20 years on, the Michael Webb that is 20 years ago in the early 60s, uh, the Michael Webb of 20 years on is a very different person to judge by the single 30 drawing project that makes up the bulk of his exhibition. I'd like to say, I don't think I'm a bit different. Not different at all. I still abide by some of the very exciting things Archigram was saying back in the early 60s. And I think this project is a way of working out some of those notions, those ideas. Among them were the need to uh, have buildings that move, that buildings that are constantly changing, being constantly built, torn down, put up again. And I think it's an excitement with things that move and go bump in the night, that are always changing. Uh, it comes from the television image. It's so rich and so influential that one wants to make one's architecture respond to this. Stand alongside it is a phrase from the movie. And this project is an attempt still to work on those ideas. <coughs> and I want to quote now David Green's article because I've taken a slightly different tack. If our wish then was to have an architecture that moved, that changed, that was never the same. I'm bringing back a slight difference here. Say the building itself was static, was immobile, but that building was rich enough to create in our minds mental journeys we could make, that it would give rise to imaginative thoughts which would suggest structures, images. This is what I'm really getting at in this project. And David, in 1971, wrote an article in which he uses an image, a painting by Sally Hodgson, and it's of a rocky waterfall. And I'm not sure quite where it is, I'm afraid, to say in the slides, but you know, yes. By the way, that's the site of course. Low cloud cover at the top, and the ellipse that's poking through it. Uh, 
come back to this. Yes, there it is. The painting by Sally Hodgson. Not well, a painting, I suppose. It's actually a photograph. Um, I'm going to quote, I'm going to read from David's very beautiful article. David is someone who, when you read what he's written, you know that he's a true writer, that he has a way of putting words together in a very magic way. I was looking... This is actually quoting Sally Hodgson talking about her own work, this picture. I was looking at some photographs of the work of Richard Long, mowed marks in large areas of grass, and they appeared as works of architecture, although I had previously been informed that they were intended to be read as works of art. I was interested as to why they seemed to be works of architecture. Now here's David talking. I was similarly puzzled by the photograph. What are these lines? Are they the residue of some departed building? Are they the plotted roots in space of a temperature gradient? Or are they the territorial limits, like the lines marking out a football pitch of some environment yet to take place? And I wonder, they're wonderfully evocative. And can anyone in the room think of yet another possible explanation for their presence there? Speak up, you know, this is... What could they mean other than what I've quoted? I can ask that because I thought of something else, you see. And, uh, <coughs> no one? No, I thought they could be the joint lines in sheets of mirror glass which happen to be reflecting an environment behind one's head. You see? A bit touch of the Norman Fosters there. <laughs> um, and this is what... I was so influenced both by this painting and this article that I thought that the structures one creates could be journeys in the mind. I talked, when I was discussing infinity, I talked about a physical journey, a journey that, through its movement, brought into being a building, and consequently, were one to go away from that building, the building would revert back to what it was, i.e. the little classical folly. This one here gives rise to journeys of the mind, and that's what I'm being most excited about with this project. And this drawing here, and now we need the spotlight again. Thank you, how's that? This one, this sketch, is of the total length of the regatta course, and this is where some of the white shadows have become solid objects. This is a shadow, a white shadow, created by the trees that line the course. The trees have been dissolved away, such that one is left with the solid shadows. And so it's possible to conceive this mental journey where one is floating down the river, and on either side, are these white structures, which were the shadows, the white shadows from trees. And um, yes. um, so can we now lights out and go back? I'll go back. How do I go backwards? Ah, okay. Yeah, uh, no, right, okay, thanks. All right, yes, I'm sorry that's upside down, but actually, since you can't read anyway, it works just as well that way up. Um, the derivation of the shape of the boat inside which the person travels down the river This 
spherical shape here is actually the dome of the temple extended to be a complete sphere. And as the traveler inside the submarine makes a journey down the river, so the floodlight that illuminates the temple makes another journey. And the journey begins, just actually thought of a rather nice drawing to do, of the mechanism by which the floodlight would travel. Do that when I get back. Um, what happens is that the floodlight mechanism starts on the surface of the dome and then makes a journey out to a maximum point and then comes back in again until it touches the surface of the dome. Or it goes through some of these elliptical holes I invented and it runs through so you get a funny sort of bonus object. Now, what's happening then is that the floodlight, it moves, and as it does so, it shines a cone of light onto the surface of the sphere. Now, the intersection of a cone and a sphere gives rise to a shape like that, right? The, the yolk of the fried egg. But by altering the angle of the light to the surface of the dome, you can get a whole variety of shapes. This particular one is this shape because the top ray of light coming from the floodlight is tangential to the sphere. Someone gets a point. So what you do, you have a series of shapes, of pools of light, which go from minute to big, back to minute again. Because obviously, the farther away from the surface the light is, the bigger the pool of light. If you take all those pools and stack them one above the other, so they touch, you will end up with a funny sort of shape which is doing that. So what you're getting is a weird shape that springs very naturally from a shape of total simplicity and purity. Uh, let me see. Yes, now this is uh, a similar type of drawing, a bit more difficult to see perhaps, where you have the pool of light created by the floodlight when it's at its maximum distance from the sphere. And again, the top ray, which is that one, actually just kisses the surface of the sphere. So you get the point there. And so here's that shape transposed over there with all the other ones on top of it, creating this funny form. Now, the original temple didn't have any holes in it, the elliptical eyelets. So I invented them because I thought it would be rather nice and cute to have a hole in the boat. And the hole in the dome gets transposed into the hole in the boat. The, actually, the shape of the boat doesn't matter because it's floating down the river. It floats like a leaf. Um, anyway. These were not in the exhibition. These are simple photographs of an earlier stage of the project, um, another design for the submarine. Actually, the drawing that's in there, the green drawing, the elevation of the submarine, uh, this is a model of it. <coughs> this here is the swelling that the traveler's head is in. And on the top right, one has the boat split open. and the cone of vision, when the person looks down the river, the abstraction of the cone of vision, and you know what that is, that is everything within the cone of vision you see in focus. And the cone of vision in this case has become a solid object and fits inside the submarine. And so the person 
his eyes are situated at the apex of the cone. And uh, this is another one. You see the cone again there with the eyes back there. series meant to show a certain fascination I have with dots which has been present over quite a time. This was a project for a, the credits for a TV soap opera consisting a series of dots on the screen which would expand or contract and reveal certain letters and words. This is starting to say 9 p.m. on NBC. and then Visions of Ecstasy, which is the name of the soap opera, becomes solid and 9 p.m. on NBC starts to dissolve. One of the characters in it. And then Judy herself is dissolving. This would be interposed with images of the characters. But the whole point is to get your attention by flashing blue and red onto the screen. You see, so that even if you're doing something else, the television demands your attention. Yes. Um, so there's supposed to be a discussion or something after this, isn't there? And I think, I mean, is everyone invited? How does that work? No, oh, well, embarrassment, <laughs> embarrassment. Um, but I, you see, I, what I wanted to do was ask if there were any questions which I'd be happy to answer because I presume a lot of you have seen the drawings. And, um, you know, if you wonder what it's all about, why don't you ask me? Because you've got the person here to answer the questions. No, so does anyone have any questions? There's going to be a horrible silence now. Why did the boat split in two? Well, because the person inside the boat is travelling down the river to the temple, the object being that he or she will spend the night there, that there needs to be a container contain the person while they sleep. And because I don't want to put a solid object on the island, and I want the design of anything that does happen not to be or ever to be the result of me sketching around on a bit of yellow face until something happens that I like. I want it to all happen naturally, to come out of the program. Um, the boat travels down the river. When it gets there, it splits open, as Martin says, like pistachio nut. And the part containing the traveler is lifted up and placed facing the way he or she has come. So the boat changes its function, whereas it was a means of floating down the river. Now it becomes a container for the traveler to sleep in. And so it's split along the line that provides him or her with the most wonderful view back down the river. Okay. Um, and it's only actually at this moment when the traveler wakes up and it's daybreak and he can see where he's come. Does he understand what was going on before? It's like a cheap who done it. You know, suddenly you realize what it was all about, what was happening. Because red herrings have been thrown in the way. The orange drawing with the disc in it was a red herring to make the traveler think that in fact the temple was not where it was at all, but a great distance behind it. And in fact, the floating disc on the water, if in fact it ever existed, is again meant to confuse the traveller because perhaps the temple is in front of where it actually is. I feel that's very important in the project. See? 
So no one's going to ask anything more. No, dreadful silence. Ah, yes. Um, the shape of the ship in the end with the hose, right, just all the... Um, yeah, the pools of light stacked on top of one another. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, that's how they make a boat, right? They take sections through it and connect the sections up to the plans and elevations. Uh, it, it's actually a wonderful way when you correct the drawings and then make a model, you get the most beautiful smooth flowing shapes. No. Yes. Um, do you think part of the existence of your drawings is in writing about them, your writing about them, and talking about them? They certainly come to life with you talking about them. When you're doing them, are you thinking about <coughs> expressing them verbally eventually? I don't know. I, um, I have to think about that. Um, I think the nicest way to discuss them is when you have a friend there, and then it comes alive. It, it's funny, during this lecture I felt rather closed up. Um, sometimes I feel wonderfully expansive about it. Um, it's very difficult to say, really, because it all happens so slowly. I, you know, when you actually make something, when you're inventing something, it comes in bits by bit. When you think of something, when you've been working on a project for a week and nothing has happened, nothing has developed, you get very depressed. When something finally tricks, clicks, you get so excited, and it seems what you've done is the most wonderful thing, you know. And I wish I could talk about it. I wish every time I thought something nice happened with it, with its development, that I could tape record it during the first flush of inspiration, you know, and make that the lecture. When you talk about something much later, like when I talk about the white shadows, when I first evolved those, they seemed such a wonderful thing, but now, you know, they're getting a bit stale. Perhaps it means it's time to move on to something very different. Um, so I think there's that answer. Mm. Yes. Um, I I've, I've been uh, working for a local authority for seven years. I'm, I'm probably very humdrum as the ordinary. Oh, no, it's a delight to hear you. It seems to me that architecture in terms of looking at evolution, if one looks back, you know, for billions of years, then we know that buildings only happened for a little while, and, and human beings have happened a little bit longer. And uh, it seems to me we're part of here, building is a product of evolution, whether it's animals or humans, it's all the same sort of thing going on. And, uh, um, but uh, uh, in what we what we're doing now, why we're doing, well, we don't know. But uh, uh, what what you what it seems to me the only real thought I can have, which is a value, maybe. I don't know if this is correct, but I think it is. Is that we're what we're doing is to help one another, to help people who might be to help another individual, who might be helping many people. And uh, I don't, I, if that makes sense, or if it doesn't, you know, what you are doing, is it, uh, is it maybe like a, a cream cake or something, which it makes you feel good, you need it, and you want, you need, you need things to make us happy and feel good, whether it's music or looking at painting, and, or, or is it, has it got real purpose in terms of where we are now in the world? Well, see, yeah, I have this. I, I know what I like. What you said, you know, I like it. maybe it, I don't know whether it's cream cake or stored pudding. But um, I sort of have this funny feeling, and this is terrible for an architect to say, but somehow there are enough buildings around. And you know, every time I see 
the top surface of land which once contained trees and plants and flowers, I get very upset. And think of all the birds who can't eat there and all that stuff and the worms who can't run through the soil and everything. But because of that, I rather like the work of an architect in the States called Peter Eisenman. And he did a project in Italy, in Verona. It looks a bit like this. Um, goes a little something like this. Um, this is actually one tiny little bit of it. But he's very interested in memory and what is to come, what is, and what was before. And what he's done, you see, whereas one, say, I'm looking down from the air like a bird, and uh, you've got a bit of soil and maybe there's a tree, you know. Now that's what is at the moment. The bulldozers are going to come along and remove that, right? But what he's doing, actually, is lifting it up like that. God knows somehow enclosing that. And then having a building underneath it. So this remains. Of course, it doesn't really remain. Right? I mean, you might as well make this out of fiberglass for all the uh, connection with what it once was. But the gesture is there, you see. And I think that's what I've been trying to do, to make a gesture, you see that if we can't have buildings anymore because we can't, we need land, we need trees and grass. Because after all, the climate's getting warmer, isn't it? And no one minds. This is terrible. I mean, in 150 years, perhaps, it's going to be 50 days a year over 100 degrees in London. Um, you know, if we can't build buildings anymore, then perhaps if we fantasize about them, if we invent them in our minds, then perhaps we're doing something. But we make the life of our minds richer and our powers to invent it. So these are all inventions. And actually, if you think about it, there's not one iota of change for the regatta course in spite of all this. It's the way one sees it and views it. Yes? Um, why did you choose way from shadows? Well, that's a nice question. Yeah, I like that one too. Because it's nothingness. White to me signifies nothingness. And there's another drawing that is out there. And uh, is the telephone room really shut now? Probably. Well, this is where I spend three minutes answering that question. I'm so glad you asked that. You're almost like a plant in the audience, you know? Because some dear, sweet, loving people like Richard and Jenny here have uh, asked questions, you know, where no one was, and it's like they were plants almost. But here's a plant, because it's just the question I wanted to hear, because uh, it reminds me of something. See, being a totally schizoid person in the meaning of the word that is most often used today, right? Not the real meaning, because you apply the word schizoid to anyone who has sort of two different ways of thinking and going and all that stuff, right? I also love the Beaux-Arts and their renderings. You can see that in those drawings of the temple. I mean, all that putting on the Chinese ink washes with the consistency of washing up water. You know, I love doing all that stuff. Gradually building up soft, warm tones. But there's something rather beautiful about the way those art students were forced to do their drawings. I do mean forced. Um, and it's like this. Well, that may not seem like it. I am answering your question. Um, because, let me stand over here. Because if you had an elevation of a building, and let's do a really dreary Beaux-Arts building, you know, something like that. Your question is nice because it's something I forgot to say when I was talking about infinity. Um, there's a you know, terrible Beaux-Arts building. Um, what you would do when you rendered that with your incredibly thin washes of Chinese ink would be to make these forward planes in light 
white. And as the planes in light receded away from the eye, they would get ever so slightly grayer, and grayer and grayer as they further receded. Likewise, the shadows cast by the center, say, would be very dark there, but not quite as dark as, say, the shadows from the corners because these shadows are a bit further away. And if you had another recession like that and the shadow there, that would be grayer still. So what you're doing is getting planes in light getting darker as they recede away from the eye, and planes in shade getting lighter. So there's one point at which they meet, at which the shadow planes are the same tone as the light planes. And I call that infinity. And I've done a drawing which is locked in the telephone room. Uh, perhaps we could all go and look through the window afterwards. Um, which shows this, which therefore grey becomes middle grey, which is a 6A on the Pantone scale. A 6A, that represents infinity. But see, the shadows, the white shadows, aren't infinity. So, um, did you have another color in mind that you thought was better suit? Because if so, tell me. No, no I didn't. Oh, did he? Because I, I wondered about that myself, whether it was appropriate to do them white. I mean, if you've got gray and white, then what should be black? I don't know. Yeah, but it's interesting. <coughs> Today, I had a discussion with somebody about photography and the three main the primary colors mm -hmm. and put through a prism it just makes white light. Yes. So it's just exactly all the colors producing light. Which would so suggest I don't know, I just went. <laughs> no it doesn't because even with colours if you recede it goes towards grey, doesn't yeah. it? Blue in the atmosphere because of the dust, but grey really. Mm -hmm. Well that's lovely. Any more questions that make me remember what I meant to say and talk about my thing beforehand. What color would be infinity? I just spent <coughs> ten minutes explaining. <laughs> Who said that? Stand up the boy. Gray. Pantone six A. 